Take your Bible and turn with me, please, to Joshua and chapter 12. Joshua and chapter 12. Let me give you an overview of this chapter. From verse 1 to 6, we have a memorial of the victory over Sihon and Og. Now, those were battles fought under the governance of Moses, and they are on the east side of Jordan. And then this book of Joshua concerns uh, what follows, which is uh, from verse 7 down to verse 24, a remembrance of 31 different kings that Joshua and the Israelites overcame. So that's the summary of this chapter. That's the overview. That's the summary. Uh, what more could we say about it than that? It's hardly one of those warm devotional passages, is it, of the Bible, uh, a lovely psalm to uh, meditate on and think about this morning. Uh, but I suggest to you that there's something in all of God's word that is profitable for the Bible teaches us that. Paul said that all scripture is given by inspiration. It's breathed out by God. Let me suggest to you, uh, before I come to the subject that we're thinking about, uh, let, me, let me suggest to you one of the reasons we find this unrelatable is because we weren't there. You imagine that you've been there, and let me pick one of these kings at random, uh, the king of Makeda, uh, uh, whoever he was. And as this list was read, and those ancient Israelites uh, could uh, listen to the record of what they, they had come to them, it would be, aha, I remember that battle. I remember it well. I remember how many uh, chariots he had. Uh, I remember his armed guard that he had around him. I, I remember the field in which, uh, or the valley, or the plain in which we fought. I remember chasing him for three hours straight and eventually catching up to him and defeating his personal bodyguard. I remember it well. One of the reasons that uh, we can't relate to it is because we weren't there. And so therefore it somewhat loses something of its significance to us. That's kind of true on a sentimental level, isn't it? Uh, when you have a possession or a thing and it means something to you, but it might be worthless and meaningless to someone else. And uh, they might say, well, that's old and it's broken and you need to replace that. And you might say, ah, but my great, great grandmother gave me that. So that's precious to me. You see, uh, and so it is that to Joshua and the Israelites, these things were uh, imminently relatable and, and uh, comprehensible. But uh, uh, so there's an explanation as to why when we come to these lists of names and so on, we find them unrelatable. It's a bit like the lists of names of who inherited what, and we shall come to some of those. Now, if that was your name written there, you'd be happy to read that list. You couldn't wait till it got to your name and the bit that was given to you and your inheritance. I wonder if there's a picture there of heaven when the Lamb's Book of Life is opened. And do you know what? It doesn't matter if, if there's millions upon millions of other names. What you're interested in is, is my name there? Is my name there? You see, and so that's why we find it unrelatable. But my subject this morning is about looking back in order to go forward. Looking back in order to go forward. God's people are a people who should often be looking backward. Not living in the past. No, no, there are some people and they do that, don't they? they? They are going through life backwards. They are worried about what happened yesterday. They were worried about what happened two years ago, four years ago, six years ago, uh, when they were a youth or a child. Uh, they, they live their life, going through life, looking backwards. And that's not what I mean at all. But remembering, remembering the works of God, that's what this chapter is all about. It's a pause in proceedings. Okay, we've come thus far, 
and we've got further to go because the very next chapter says there's a few more battles to fight, but the, the war is over and the inheritance is now to be given out. But let's just take a moment, the author of the scriptures is saying, let's just take a moment, let's just pause for a beat and just realize how far we've come and what has now happened and what's been accomplished. And I suggest to you that that is a wonderful thing to do, to look back at the works of God and to remember what the Lord has done for us in three different ways. It is good to look back because looking back, number one, looking back edifies our minds. Number two, looking back encourages our hearts and looking back three excites our faith. And I want to just go through those three reasons as to why it isn't a very expository message this morning where I'm going through verse by verse or line by line this, this chapter. But I'm taking the whole and thinking about this whole uh, revelation, if you like, that this chapter gives us and applying that to us in our circumstances and, and what they're doing here, looking back. So number one, looking back edifies our minds. What did this do for these ancient Israelites? Well, they had reached a momentous point in their history, a point that it had been building up to for some significant period of time. And I'm sure that uh, nobody wanted the war to last any longer than necessary, but it had lasted. And if you take and extend that period back further over time, the, the, the promise was waiting for a, a, such a long period where Abraham was a nomad and then Isaac and his uh, exploits and travels uh, about, and then Jacob who nearly got killed by Esau and, and all that happened to him and then uh, his own sons uh, turned out to uh, try and deceive him, but uh, they then went to Egypt in the famine, and then uh, as they lived there, eventually when Joseph had died, they became slaves, and then uh, the plagues happened, and then they, they were delivered out of Egypt in a, in a marvelous way, and brought to uh, the most terrifying scene for them in the Bible, the Mount Sinai, where they met face to face with God, and God appointed a way, a tabernacle, so that they could still worship him through the blood, through the sacrifice, and they could approach a holy God as sinners and uh, worship him. And they uh, worshipped him that way all the way through the wilderness where there were all sorts of incidents. There was no water and there was, uh, then there was uh, plenty of water, but it was bitter water. And then uh, they got water out the rock and then uh, the sky opened up and poured food down for the manna. Uh, angels' food, uh, and, and on another occasion, the way was extremely hard, and they got discouraged, and they, they murmured against God, uh, and they had the audacity to complain of what the Almighty was doing, so he sent serpents among them, but then uh, when they cried out to him because he loves them, he saved them, and he raised up a serpent and said, if you look, you'll live, a picture of Jesus Christ, and then as they progressed through, eventually they come to the borders of Sihon and uh, king of Bashan and Og uh, and these two great nations and uh, they're super impressive. Uh, of course, they've been wandering around 40 years. Uh, the generation who doubted and disbelieved, they've gone uh, and uh, they've got this back to the face. And it must have been imposing. It must have been hard. It must have been uh, fearful. Uh, there must have been all sorts of uh, thoughts that arose in the hearts of God's people. Uh, it must, they must have trembled before it. And yet uh, the, the message consistently comes by the Lord to Joshua as Moses has sent up that ancient mountain, looks over the land of Israel, uh, Canaan, he surveys the scene and then dies. He's taken to be with the Lord and only to appear on the Mount of Transfiguration, possibly the same mountain, who knows, but he appeared with Jesus and Elijah talking together. And then uh, Joshua is to lead the people. And that message comes, be strong and of a good courage. My, he needed that strength and he needed that good courage because the walls of Jericho were uh, mighty and impressive. And the armies that he faced were stronger and greater. And uh, they all banded together at points, didn't they? But those walls fell down. 
And despite the discouragement at AI uh, and the sin that needed to be dealt with, uh, despite the gathering foes down in the south and then up in the north, and all that took place, despite the deception of the Gibeonites, despite all these things, God had done great things. And that's what this chapter is saying. Now, just let's pause a moment and recognize that God has brought us safe thus far. It's an Ebenezer. And I think that that edifies our minds as we remember that God always brings his people safe through. And it lifts our minds to think of all that God has done and think how the Lord is the, 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 the one who saves and the one who provides and the one who defeats the foes and fights the battles and protects and provides and, and supplies the needs of his children and, and how we could trace that through all of the Old Testament and the history of Israel, all of the New Testament and the history of the church, all through the ages, and we could recall the things that God has done, the great things that God has done, and how he has preserved and provided and kept and blessed and prospered and helped. Surely that edifies the mind. You see, it's so very easy to get taken up with the battle that's next and the difficulties that are now and forget who God is. And that is not evidenced by the future because we haven't gone this way before that is evidenced and that is strengthened we are built up or edified by remembering what god has done who god is and that's what this chapter is all about so the first thing is that it edifies our minds the second thing is looking back encourages our hearts because we have a vivid reminder in this chapter that we serve a god who does amazing things there is a faithful record in in uh, all of scripture to the events that take place here and indeed they are mentioned uh throughout the bible uh, a number of the key and significant events of israel's history uh, and we shall mention something more of that in a moment. But here is the remembrance that of, I think, uh, two things. Number one, the Lord always preserves his people. And number two, the Lord always keeps his promises. The Lord always preserves his people and always keeps his promises. Here we have a faithful list and it would seem to me to be clear that uh, the inspiration of uh, God's Holy Spirit doesn't want us to leave anything off the list you see let me put it this way if I could do so if this was just one verse it'd be a lot easier to get through it but we wouldn't give it a second glance if this is one verse that said now there were a great number of enemies but they defeated all of them well, we might not pay much attention to that. We might think about that for a moment. But in listing and detailing and itemizing every single one of them, that adds to this scene, this picture, to, to, to suggest to us there was this foe, but then as they defeated this foe, there was another foe, and then there was another foe, and then there was another foe. And oh, by the way, there was another one too, and another one too. And so it went on and on and on. And someone right in the middle. So there's 31 kings here in total, two over the other side of Jordan on the east, and uh, the rest, 29, if my maths is correct, on the, on the, on the other side of, in the actual land of Canaan itself uh, on the west. And uh, imagine you're partway through. You're about at number 15 on this list. You might think, when's this going to end? When's the battle going to be over? In the next chapter, it says the Lord gave them rest from war. And let me tell you, one day, the Lord is going to give you rest from war. 
and the Lord does give you that little oasis along the way, and he gives you that little respite along the way, and that strength along the way, but there's, there's often in, 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 the, in the Christian life, there's battle after battle after battle after battle, and that's something that this chapter just reminds us of, but it isn't just a, a one and done. It isn't just, right, uh, step into Jordan through the Red Sea, uh, and uh, walk around the walls of Jericho a few times. Uh, you see, what they would do is they would they would look back and they would think in their minds. They would think, Ah, oh, do you remember those days when we were day after day we just walked around Jericho and we were all not allowed to talk and say a word and we we all looked to each other and wondered what on earth is Joshua doing? Well, we know that we're we're following him as our new leader, but oh, what is he doing? And uh, then on the last day he made us walk around seven times. Do you remember? And then they might have a smile on their face, enjoying their hearts and saying, ah, oh, but do you remember when the walls fell down? And we defeated that city. But then do you remember AI? And there was a problem. And we were defeated there and chased away. And we wondered what on earth had happened, but we had to deal with ourselves and put our, our, our own house in order. And Achan had stolen something and we had to straighten that out. And then we went on and we defeated AI. Or do you remember the Gibeonites? And so we could go on through the story. You see, all of us are at some point. Now, Israel's history isn't finished here. They're at a particular fixed point. There will be battles to come and there will be miracles to come. There will be wonders of God's grace to come. But here's the point. God always preserves his people. Even when the enemies are great and they're conspiring together, God preserves his people. Remember that wonderful psalm, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills, from whence cometh my help, my help cometh from the Lord. That psalm says, the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. Another psalm tells us that as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord is around about them that fear him. And you see, no matter what dark valleys we go through, no matter what enemies conspire or battles we face or victories, or whether we've uh, lost a battle or won a victory or whatever, whatever's behind us, God is the God of eternity. So he's the God of the now and the God of the then, because he's the God of the past. And, and do you see the point that looking back encourages our hearts and reminds us God preserves his people. And they might, you might take a, a point at some later date. Uh, let's say in the book of Daniel. And uh, Daniel, it's Daniel's funeral. And Daniel, that mighty man of God who was lived so close to the Lord, had such insight into visions and dreams and mysteries of things to come. And you could see and trace his roots how that this young man, was taken as a prisoner, a slave, a captive by the Babylonian army, Nebuchadnezzar. And yet God raised him up because the Lord always preserves his people. And then we can add to that the New Testament revelation, how we see the persecutions that arise, how we see the uh, edicts of emperors, and the commands of kings to rid the world of the name of Jesus, but God always preserves his people. We come through to the great Protestant Reformation and that period of history when so many were burnt at the stake and, and murdered for their faith, but God preserved his people. And, and that gave birth to the great Puritan era, which gave birth to the great awakening era, and God preserves his people. And you see, you're at some point, and, and any, if I was to get you to draw a line this morning, and just a straight line, and, 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 and put a little mark at the beginning of that line, and a little mark at the end, and at the beginning of that line write B, and at the end of that line write E, and, and, and B represents the beginning of your life, and E represents the end of your life. No one of you could put a mark where you are. You don't know where you are on that line. You know, that's the line. Some of you children, we might think, well, you're way back here on the line. Some of the rest of us might be further up here. Who, who knows where we are? But what we can say is, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And he preserves his people. 
And the second thing that it reminds us as well is that the Lord keeps his promises. The Lord made an ancient promise. And what we have here is this point in Israel's history where they're able to say, no, God fulfilled it. God kept his promise to us. He gave this promise to give us this land. And, well, here we are. We've got the land. Now, there's more to go on to do. There's more to think about than, than, than the past. And that's what I mean. You must have lived in the past. But it's good to remember that it is the experience and the testimony of all of God's children through all of the ages. That when we do that which God tells us to do, God always honours what he promises to do. And when we obey him and keep his commands and honour him, he provides, uh, as, as, as it says uh, in the scriptures, that uh, when we uh, seek to do that which is good and right, yes, there may be valleys to pass through and there may be uh, pains and sorrows and griefs and all manner of things, but God always keeps his promises. And that's a wonderful and encouraging thing to remember. There is no promise in the book that will ever fail. God is far too mighty and far too powerful to let 31 kings get in his way. And the powers and the forces of darkness and of this world cannot hinder the almighty God that we serve, the sovereign and holy one that's on the throne, they can't for a second, for even a beat of time, prevent him from working out his plan. He is sovereign and he is almighty and we bow the knee. He's the potter, we're the clay and he's doing his will. He's working out his plan and he always is keeping his promises. The good ones and the bad ones. Because he will come and he will judge the earth. And he will work righteousness. And he will fulfill those purposes, but also the good ones too. How he promises that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He, he promises that at the last day we shall not be ashamed. You say now, as the devil tempts you to look at your sin now, you say, oh, well, perhaps I will be. No, you won't, because he always keeps his promises. Now, the difficulty is their future things that I'm talking about, and that requires faith. Requires, let me clarify, hope. Because we're saved by hope, and, and hope maketh not ashamed. Do you hope, do you have faith in the promises of God? Because this is a chapter that just pauses and says, look, none of these things stood in the way of God. And let me tell you, pandemics and all manner of other things, nothing stands in the way of our God. Nothing hinders him. Let's not forget that. Let's believe in the promises of God because the scriptures teach us all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen. In Christ Jesus, they're yea and they're amen. So that's the second thing that this chapter teaches us. It, looking back edifies our minds and looking back encourages our hearts. Here's one last thought for you. Looking back excites our faith. This chapter is, is like a song. And in fact, it is immortalized, the defeat of Sihon and Og. They are immortalized in Psalm 135 and Psalm 136. But indeed, a number of the Lord's exploits. The victory at the Red Sea, the Israelites didn't forget that. They kept that in remembrance. They were able to raise it up and say, this is what the Lord's done for us. He brought us through the Red Sea. And then as history unfolded itself, this is what the Lord's done for us. He brought us through Jordan. This is what the Lord's done for us. He raised up David from the sheep coats, looking after, as a shepherd, looking after the sheep. This is what the Lord's done for us. He's defeated our foes. This is what the Lord's done for us. When the walls were broken down, he allowed a foreign king to pay for them to be built again. This is what the Lord's done for us. He raised up a saviour, Jesus Christ. 
born of a virgin, who walked upon water, who calmed the sea with his single word, who touched the uh, lepers and made them whole. And he commanded the dead to rise up again. And then he took up his place upon the eternal cross and paid the redemption sacrifice that price for our salvation. He triumphed over death on the third day. This is what the Lord's done for us. He sent down his Holy Spirit in great power at Pentecost and 3,000 souls were saved. This is what the Lord's done for us. When Peter was needed to preach the gospel, the prison doors just flew open wide. And so we could go through all of church history. This is what the Lord's done for us. Listen, friends, we must not let the name of the Lord die. We must not allow the, the remembrance of God's mighty deeds to be forgotten. So that Psalm 145 tells us, One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honour of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works, and men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. Are we those who abundantly utter the memory of God's great goodness? And we remember, see how good God is. See how loving he is. See how merciful he is. See how kind he is. See how powerful he is. The remembrance of what God has done here is that we don't just have the God of the impossible. We have an unchanging God. We believe and we trust in and we serve the God who defeated 31 kings when they were greater and mightier. We believe in the God who parted the Red Sea. We believe in the God who calmed the storm. We believe in the God who can raise the dead. We believe in the God who created the world. This God, this God of the Bible, this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this God is our God forever and ever. He is your God. So let that excite your faith today. That God can do anything, impossible things. Let that excite you to believe that right now, right today, in 2021, on March the 28th, God can do amazing miracles. God can do things that have never been done before. Who is there to say among us, he cannot? Let that excite your faith. There was circumstances in church history where everything seemed so dead and lifeless and uh, at the time, let's say, at the time of George Whitfield and the Wesley brothers, John and Charles Wesley. And uh, the Church of England was uh, experiencing great dearth. And the first time that George Whitfield went and he preached uh, in the uh, Church of England church, I think it was in Bristol, uh, the bishop was, uh, he was reported to the bishop that everyone went mad. Because for the very first time, souls started to get saved. And you see out of nothing, then just it just burst into life. Have you ever seen those uh, documentaries or pictures of the desert in the rainy season, where it's just totally barren, lifeless, brown desert? And then the rain comes and it just bursts into life. You see how God can do that? He, he has done that in the past. And whatever he has done, he can do. You see, what we need is greater faith. And so therefore, I suggest to you that what we need to do is more often look back and remember and not let the praises of the Lord die and not forget the greatness of our God. So friends, what about your life? As I draw this to a conclusion this morning, what about your life? Can't you look back and say, hitherto hath the Lord helped us? Depends what you focus on. If you look back and focus on all your faults and all your failings, well, that's not going to encourage your heart or excite your faith at all. It's certainly not going to edify your mind. But if you look back and see the hand of God, his mercy, his grace, his kindness, his goodness, where the Lord's brought you through, difficulties, troubles, he's preserved your soul, maybe even your body and your life too, how the Lord is a good God, a kind God, a merciful God, a generous God, a faithful God, a God who is 
compassionate with our weakness, a God who forgives and washes away our sins, who heals all our diseases. God, so full of power and so full of greatness, yet a God who is our friend. Can't you raise an Ebenezer this morning? Can't you look back and say, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. He's heard my cries. He's answered my prayers. He's provided for my needs. He's preserved me thus far. And therefore, let us not be overwhelmed with fears or hopelessness. I want to pick up on that theme again this evening. But for the sake of closing this message this morning, yes, this isn't a warm, devotional, sort of fuzzy passage on one level, is it? It's a list of 31 kings. But remember, remember that Israel was taught here by this look back and never let it be forgotten how good and great our God is. Amen.